everybody, it's Romania Black, and we're on episode seven of Chainsaw Man. <laughs> and I'm, yeah, so Dingy has, I'm pretty excited, Dingy has jumped into the belly of the beast, this eternity devil, whatever that's gonna lead us to, and and who knows what's gonna happen. I was, I was a bit concerned about Aki in the last episode because he literally got stabbed, and it was a pretty deep stab wound, but power using her ability to manipulate blood perhaps has stopped the bleeding. Maybe it's going to save him. Maybe Aki might be down for the count for the rest of the battle, but he may hopefully not die. But I don't know. I don't know what Fujimoto has planned. It would not surprise me if Fujimoto kills off big characters because he just seems like the type of mangaka, kind of like um, Akutami with Jujutsu Kaisen, that is not afraid to do unconventional things in your shonen anime. So... I don't know. I don't know what that's going to lead us to, but I'm pretty excited about it regardless. So I do have several comments before we start episode seven though, but I'm pretty excited. We're on episode seven. We're officially halfway through the season. We haven't talked about the three act structure in a while that we're right in the middle of that second act. Uh, I was talking to Discord today. I, 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 don't, I hope I wasn't a bother, but people were starting to talk about like getting hyped about this episode. And I was like, please, spoiler tag so that I don't know. Because I don't want to get too hyped up if it's a really good episode. I want to go in as blind as I can. And they were talking about, well, you did say the rule of eight. And I was like, I know, I did. And so the rule of eight usually is like in a 12 episode series or season, the eighth episode's really good. And that's next week's episode. So this episode may be really great too. You know what? Series like Attack on Titan. Titan, in Attack on Titan, that series has proven me wrong because the eighth episode of that series and its seasons sometimes hasn't been the best episode. Sometimes it's been like episode five or episode seven. So I've been proven wrong before, but I, I try not to hype myself up with episodes because I want to go in kind of on a neutral playing field and be surprised. So I try to keep myself a little bit, try to keep my anticipations quelled and then I get hyped up when it actually turns out to be a really awesome episode. So there's that. But uh, I do have some comments I want to go to before we start this episode. Um, Arwen Lostlorn talks about uh, Dingy. He may actually have more devil hunting experience than the others in this situation because he spent his entire life basically devil hunting for the Yakuza. And I thought that was a really good point to bring up. It helps to explain why he's so calm in this situation because he's dealt with many different kinds of devils. Whereas Kobini and Arai, this is their kind of rookies on the job, they don't have the experience that Dingy has. And Dingy may actually have more devil hunting experience than like Aki does. So I think that was really cool to point out. Um, and he can figure out, and I like it also explains how he's able to figure out all the different ways that devils will attack him. And so he kind of figures out how to approach this eternity devil by him. I'm going to make it feel so much pain that it's going to kill itself. I think that's pretty cool. So I think you're pointing that out, Arwen. That was really great. Um, Sam Mala talks about how devils can not only be physical manifestations of fear, but they can also tap into like abstract and more like metaphysical kind of abstraction because yeah the idea of the eternity devil eternity is not something that's tangible or physical it's kind of an abstract concept and so i agree with sam mala in saying that fujimoto is kind of tapping into this really cool idea and concept that these monsters may not be based on physical things that cause fear but thought processes and, and abstract concepts that cause fear. And I'm like, oh, that could get really, really creative depending on how far Fujimoto wants to take that concept. So we'll see what happens. But I like that idea. And we've seen it kind of like hinted at here with the Eternity Devil. Very, very interesting. Um, Christopher Peterson brought up a really good point. Who holds the devils to their contracts? Is it just part of their physiology? Is it, how does that work? You know, is there a supernatural force, a God, something that keeps them that if they don't adhere to the contracts, they die? It's a good question to bring up. I don't want answers. <laughs> I'm going to find out as we go, right? But it is a little world building question to kind of tuck away and pin in the back of my brain, right? But not only saying that, um, do, do the other countries get part of the gun devil because that was kind of brought up it was said in the comments people were talking about like the public safety commission is a government entity in japan so it makes sense why they would have access to the gun devil pieces do other countries have access or is it just japan if it is just japan why just japan so there's little questions like are there pieces of the gun devil in big conglomerate clunks and chunks like the one that makima has around the country around the world how does that work? So there, these are little, I don't want answers, obviously, because I want to find out as we go, but I'm pinning them in the back of my brain, these questions you all are positing, that I'm like, yeah, we might want this series to eventually answer them, and maybe they'll answer them this season. 
Maybe they won't. Maybe that's something two seasons down the road will get answered. Who knows, right? But I thought that was really good to point out, right? Very good to ask. Um, Puri says from episode five, there are lots of Fooly Cooly references. I won't say them all because I've watched the original Fooly Cooly, although I watched it when it first came out and I was probably much too immature to really fully grasp it. I would like at some point to go back and rewatch Fooly Cooly as an adult. And I feel like the content and the themes of it would resonate much better now than they did when I watched it when I was like 12. So, <laughs> or 14. So yeah, I feel like eventually that may, that's on my rewatch list is Fooly Cooly to rewatch it and see what it's about. But um, I won't say all the references because I don't want to spoil you all if you've not seen Fooly Cooly, but just go to episode five of my reactions, look for Pori's comment, P-O-R-Y, and they have a whole list of them. They were really cool. I thought they were fun. A uh, non-binary Jet Lung coming in with all the symbolism for the episode 5 ED. Uh, thank you, Jet Lung, for bringing all these out. Again, MC Escher's works, lots of references to those throughout the ED. Um, also, End of Evangelion, tying that in. I really like that. Uh, Michelangelo's Pieta, the painting, the one with Dingy and Makima in there. The painting references, it draws attention and what Jutland was saying in the comment was that the idea behind the painting with Makima holding Dinji is that it draws attention away from Christ's wounds in the original painting and towards the Virgin Mary, which I'm like, oh, imagine that. We're drawing attention away from Dinji and his suffering and bringing the focal point back to Makima. Imagine that. What? So I kind of liked that little symbolism there, that little nudge there. I like it. And then apparently, um, the way that non-binary Jet Lung interpreted it was that the five horses represent the squad, with the exception of Dingy. Dingy is not included in the five, the five horsemen of the apocalypse. You have the black horse, which Jet Lung said represented Arai. You have the unicorn with the knife, which is Himeno, because she's got the knife in this uh, in episode six, of course. Um, the centaur, it, or it represents Kobino. Um, Himeno is represented by the centaur. The bloody horse is power of course. And then the, the horse that is represented with Aki has like its head and stuff made out of fingers, which could tie the whole cone thing, but also guns, pieces of guns, which could explain, like it could draw from the idea of Aki's sense of revenge from the gun devil, which I like the idea that it transitions from that horse that Aki is represented by to this long descending endless spiral staircase, which I talked to non-binary shit in the comments saying that to me, that kind of seems to represent like Aki's spiral, like this revenge spiral. It's just endless. It never stops. Once you try to get revenge on something, it's a never ending cycle and you'll never be satisfied. And so that's kind of what I thought it was representing in the ED, but I like E's like the one for episode five because it's very open to interpretation and you can kind of debate about it endlessly. So that's a lot of fun. But thank you, non-binary non Jetlung, for that. Um, Alexander Q pointed out that the gun devil pieces are very similar to Jujutsu Kaisen and Sukuna's fingers. And I'm like, yes, I, I imagine Fujimoto and Akutami are friends, much like Akutami and Horikoshi are friends. They're all just like a little triad of young mangaka and they're all best, best buddies. So yeah, there's a little bit of reference there. I like it. And then Blue. Blue talked about how the number eight was used throughout episode six. And I really liked this because the number eight is the sign of infinity. So you had the clock stuck on 818, right? It's the infinity sign. So I was like, ah, that all makes a lot of sense. I like it. And I like that he also said how um, Power in the actual series, when you listen to her in the original Japanese uh, voice cast, she speaks in like an old Japanese accent. It's very formal. And so when they translate it into the English sub, that's why it's like, twas I and tis this, because it's supposed to sound like it's very old fashioned. So I thought that was pretty cool. And then finally, um, Ray Quiggs in episode six, Talked about how Dingy kind of maybe had the same options as Kobini. Yeah, Kobini talks about how her options were because she couldn't go to school and her family couldn't afford it, that she either had to become a devil hunter or a sex worker. And Ray Quiggs pointed out that back in episode one, Dingy had the same options from the Yakuza. It was either you become a devil hunter or you sell yourself, right? I mean, there were other options like sell his body parts and stuff, but they're basically like you could become a sex worker or sell your body or become a devil hunter. So yeah, the fact that Dingy kind of maybe knows where Kobini is coming from is rather interesting. So yeah, I, I thought those were all really good comments. I, I'm very curious, like 
how do you fight an eternity devil? How do you fight a concept? They've established that the devil does not like pain and that it physically doesn't like it, so it just makes itself bigger to try to like smush anything that tries to, you know, put up a fight. But is Dingy going to be able to succeed in making the eternity devil feel so much pain that it wants to kill itself? Will Power get the Nobel Prize? Will Dingy get that kiss? Will Aki live? Will Kobini and Arai live? We don't know. So I have waited all day and it's been so torturous being at work when this episode comes out because I know everybody in the Discord is just like black box. <laughs> like just like a long series of black boxes and I'm just like... I want to know, but I don't, right? So, and for the record, I am staying anime only with this series. Somebody asked in the Discord, and I was like, no, I'm going to stay anime only. I've stayed anime only with Jujutsu Kaisen, and I appreciate it. And it made me like the movie that much more. I'm going to stay anime only with this. It's going to be tough, but you know what? There's lots of other shows to watch in the meantime while I'm waiting on MAPPA to bust out season two of this, because you know it's coming. So, but yeah, we'll see. So... I'm excited to start episode seven, y'all. I hope you all are too, and just see what all madness takes place in this episode. And try to go in with just an open mind. See what happens. But we're gonna do that here in three, two, one, and let's uh let's do this. Oh. <laughs> ah! oh, dingy honey. Oh, Dingy, honey, I, I feel bad for our boy Dingy. I really do. And not just the barf scene. Oh, bleh. <laughs> oh my God, how gross. How gross. But, um, but just because, God, Dingy, there's actually a lot to talk about in this episode. Lots of things, right? I, what I love about this episode is I didn't know how they were going to take it. I was like, so are we going to get this big all-out epic battle with the Eternity Devil and etc, etc. No, <laughs> we don't! This episode is not about the battle. And that's kind of, I feel like Fujimoto, without spoiling anything for Neon Genesis Evangelion, I said it in the reaction, without spoiling anything, uh, what I love is that, is that Fujimoto is taking a page from Anno in Neon Genesis. I feel taking a page from Anno in how Anno deals with the idea of the battle, right? Because, you know, you have so many shown in manga, like I'm eventually going to watch Bleach and I know what's going to happen with, Be with Bleach. There's going to be these big all out shown in battles. If you've ever watched Naruto, then there's these big all out battles and, and there, and there is definitely an audience for that. And I definitely love those shown in because you know what you're getting into. I mean, I grew up watching Dragon Ball Z. You spend a whole season building up practically one giant battle, right? And so you want it to pay off, right? But what I like that Fujimoto does is he's telling a, a story that is character driven and I'm a character driven person. I, I love the shonen battles. They're fun. They're fun, but they're like they're really, there's not much you can talk about with them, right? So it's like, oh, there's all this action and blood and gore and that's it, right? What I like are shows that delve into these psychological issues and these societal issues and, and getting into other things and kind of like dealing with people and how they deal with certain stressors and situations. And Neon Genesis Evangelion, you think that you're getting one thing and it comes out and gives you something totally different. And what reminded me a lot of Neon Genesis in this episode is that there's a particular episode early on in the season and without spoiling anything, I won't tell you exactly which one it is. If you've watched that series, you'll know. But there's a certain a certain battle that you spend the entire episode prepping for it. You spend the whole episode prepping for it. It's this big ordeal. And the battle itself lasts 60 seconds. And that's all you get. And then we go back to dealing with the aftermath. And the moment that we got the, the three day later thing with Dingy and them, I'm like, that's exactly what this episode was. We spent all of episode six building up the battle, building up the Eternity Devil, building up this thing. And then episode seven's like, nope, done. Dingy did the thing. You all get the gist. Here we go. That's all that it was. You don't need to know anymore. I mean, we could have spent the whole episode watching Dingy just chainsaw his way through the Eternity Devil until it was finally, until it finally gave up. But, but Fujimoto doesn't want to waste our time. And that's what I like about the series is Fujimoto is like, I could have wasted your time giving you this big, bloody, gory battle that went nowhere and you already know how it's going to end. Or I could have you dive into this deep character study with Himeno and Makima and all this stuff with, with Dingy and we can focus on that instead. And I'm like, yes, please. So, oh my God, man. Mm. I feel like Makima 
is going to be one of those characters that I love to hate. And I don't even hate her, but I know she's not good. I know she's not a good character. She just gives so many ominous vibes to her. And there's so many, like, little things. that They're, they're like, little breadcrumbs that Fujimoto is, like, giving us. Like, like maybe, maybe we should question Makima a little bit. Maybe we should. And it's like, yes, Makima, I feel, is, is not a nice girl. Mm -mm. I feel like Kimono, it's funny, we'll talk about Makima versus Himeno in this, because they seem like the two female focal points on either side of Dinji. And then we talk about Kobeni and some of the other ones and Aki and all of this. And then we get Suda. We get my man Suda, again, playing a stoic blonde character like he normally do. Uh, what I love about Su Suda's character sounds, the guy that he plays, it sounds like they woke Suda up, the voice actor for the, he's the voice actor for the master character for Himeno. I feel like they went to Suda's house at 3 a.m., woke him up and be like, can you read these lines? Because <laughs> that's what he sounds, he, he nails the extraordinarily tired mentor character. Like, like Nanami in Jujutsu Kaisen is the adult of adults. He's kind of tired. He's had a long day at work. This guy feels like he's worked like seven 12-hour shifts in a row, didn't bother to sleep in between, barely bathed, and maybe's had like a Red Bull on day five. Like, that's, that's where he's at, right? He just seems like he's completely done. But what else can you do, right? It's either you keep doing the job or you die. That's kind of how this that's kind of how this world is with the Devil Hunters. You do your job or you're dead, which is it going to be, right? You don't just kind of retire to the Kokomos and that's it, right? That doesn't seem like they're, the, the contingency package <laughs> for these Devil Hunters. There's not much of a retirement plan, not a lot of pension with these, with these um, Devil Hunters. I would be very curious to know... And maybe, I doubt we'll get to it this season, but maybe further on in the series, we could get to, are there any retired devil hunters? Is that even a thing? Do you go into this business with the expectation that, nah, you're probably going to die young, right? Or, or what's the deal? Hmm. I give Chainsaw Man a lot of props because in this episode, it does some things and goes some places that I don't think I've seen any other anime really tiptoe across. And yeah, there's been other anime do it, in Neon Genesis case in point. But it does some really gross out things and some things that I'm like, but but the thing about the gross out thing is that it's all, the whole vomit thing, I literally want to throw up right now thinking about it. I'm like, I, I don't, I'm not easily queasy, but that sort of thing, mm -mm, can't do it. Can't do it. I, I may skip over that part of the episode because I was just like, oh, nope, gross. Um, but the fact of the matter is the gross aspects of this episode are tied to a purpose and they're tied to a character developing moment. And I feel like that's what makes them acceptable. And we'll talk about him and at the end. Oh, Dingy. I feel for Dingy. Dingy's, oh, honey, you're, if you weren't messed up before, if you didn't have a screw loose before, him and going to make sure you have quite a few screws loose. Mm. Girl. Okay, we need to talk about this. But go through this episode. There's lots of things. There's so much to talk about in this episode, actually. Lots of things to go off of. So I like that the very first shot of this episode, the very first shot is the, the, t the hotel tilted. Everything is tilted and warped right on its side. Nothing is, nothing is right. Nothing is prim and proper. And Aki just, I'm glad Aki's okay. Glad, glad the power was able to help him. And he's like, I, the way that Dingy's voice actor, he was like, nobody asked you, you asshole. Like, the way that Dingy's voice actor said that line, like, the line reading of Dingy's voice actor is so good. Like, the fact that he's, like, a debut voice actor and this is his first role, and he just, the way he does his inflection, the the character, the everything that he bodies in Dingy, I feel like it makes me like his character so much more. And I've seen some people in the Discord say that they appreciate Dingy's character much more because of the anime than in the manga, and I'm like... That's, that's the sign of a good voice actor. It reminds me a lot. Honestly, it reminds me of Yuki Kaji, who voices Aaron Yeager in Attack on Titan. And seeing how influential Yuki Kaji's voice has become for Aaron, I feel like this voice actor is going to be that with Dinji. Like, that's going to elevate the character to another level, right? At least that's what I think. And he's like, I'm through owing anybody with anything. Yep. And then just heads on down there. So he's like, once we're out of here, we're even. Yep. And then jumps on down to the belly of the beast. Oh my god, yeah. And of course, they've never seen Dingy be Chainsaw Man. I don't even think Aki's really seen him be Chainsaw Man either. 
But yeah, then he pops out and everything and just gets all the blood and guts. And so they say, I knew you were alive, Chainsaw. So, okay, we're gonna talk about this. Let's just, just bring this out right off the bat. So, Pochita got history, right? That's the question. Pochita is the chainsaw devil, right? Pochita is the chainsaw devil. And the eternity devil, which seems like a rather timeless devil, right? That it's been, it seems like it's pretty old. The eternity devil knows it. It knows Pachita. It's it's knew it was alive, right? Hmm. And says it knew you were alive, and then like just goes after Denji. And Denji's like, I don't know. So uh, it just it just rips his arm up. It's so gross. We need to talk about Denji. We're gonna put Denji right here. We're gonna put Denji right here. Denji, who is sixteen years old. I forget that so much in this series. I keep thinking he's like eighteen or nineteen. I'm like, oh, Denji's eighteen or nineteen. No, he's sixteen. 16. He is a, he is not a baby, but he is a child. He is a young man. He's a teenager. He is not an adult. He needs an adult. Maybe not him and but he needs an adult. Maybe not Makima, but he definitely is still young and immature, right? And impressionable, right? So let's say some things we know about Denji. He is attached. He's attached to the chainsaw devil. It's kind of weird. I guess they did form a contract, theoretically, technically. He's like, I'll give you my body in exchange for you living. That's technically a contract. They're contracted together. Okay, I guess that works. I like that Pachita was nice enough to say, I just want to see you have your dreams come true. Okay. But yeah, but Dingy just being like, I, he's like all better. And he like connects the arm back together. Uh. So we need to establish some facts too. The fact that when he eats, when he eats or drinks the blood or flesh of devils, he becomes more devilish. Like that maniacal laughter that he has, like as Makima and them, are, as Himeno and them are staring at him, like that maniacal laughter, like just he look, it sounds like demonic. Like that's because he's been eating and drinking the blood of the Eternity Devil. So anytime, and he did that as well with the Bat Devil. So anytime, or the Leech Devil rather. So anytime that happens, he just becomes more devilish, right? The more he consumes of devils, the more he becomes like one in that moment. Okay. It is important to note that. And he tells Denji that they won't find the heart there and that they can't kill them. But in the end, it ends up offering his heart to him anyway. So maybe it was there all along and he was just lying to Denji. We don't know. And Arai is just like, what the hell? And him and Kobini is like, oh my God. And just like he's sitting there like a dog ripping apart the guts and the flesh off the eternity devil, right? Doing something that humans wouldn't normally do, right? So that kind of like animalistic animalistic uh i'll just put fiendish even though i know i know he's not really a fiend fiendish and non-human actions he becomes the monster to fight monsters right which can connect to other series right that we've seen on this channel <laughs> but yeah he basically becomes a monster to fight monsters and himeno notes that her master was telling her that just ordinary humans that are like straight laced they're not going to cut it. They have to have a screw loose. They got to be a little bit of a monster themselves. And so that's why him and I was like a devil. And I, I just love the powers like this bodes ill. Like power just sitting there speaking in old Japanese. He's losing blood ceaselessly. When he's lost too much, his chainsaws will retract. Like power knows how this mechanism works. And so Dingy decides like, nah, I'm just going to, if that's the case, then I'm just going to eat you. Mm-hmm. And then we go to the OP. We're going to skip the OP as much as I love the OP. All right. We're going to skip it. Okay. So let's talk about, let's talk about this episode once the, down there. And it looks like all of the hands and stuff are trying to reach towards them in the hotel room. But Dingy, like, uh, it's like has all of, like, it's just grabbed his body and everything. And he's like, oh, my chainsaws are in. He's like, I need more blood. And then I love the faces are all like, you failed, Chainsaw. And then he just bites a chunk out of him. 
And Dingy establishes that he ain't afraid to eat to survive, right? And he just eats that part of the devil and starts, he's like, this blood tastes like shit, right? He says, this blood might taste like shit, but watching you shriek in pain makes it sweet like strawberry jam. Which seems, which, yeah, the strawberry jam is kind of like, you know, that kind of analogy to the blood and guts and everything. And and that's kind of devilish too, the idea that seeing it shriek in pain. Like that seems, the idea of it shrieking in pain seems more like Pachita would get a rise out of it. But it's like, sweet old Pachita? What? Getting a rise out of pain from and suffering from another devil? What? I think it's easy to forget because Pachita's so freaking adorable <laughs> that Pachita's a devil. So of course, even though it's attached itself to Dingy, literally and figuratively, and loves Dingy, it's still a devil. It, it still wants some destruction and violence, right? And it's using Dingy to channel that. But we established in this episode multiple times through various means that Dingy, he is a survivalist. He is not afraid, not afraid to do what is needed to live. It's kind of that fight or flight syndrome and Dingy very much is the fight. He's like, if I'm gonna have to eat garbage to live, I'm gonna eat garbage to live. If I've gotta drink and eat a devil in order to survive, I'm gonna do it because that's my only option. If I've gotta like, just, we'll talk about the whole barf comment, but yeah, he's basically like, no, if I need to survive, it's, it's what I'm gonna do. Again, we go back to this idea of the pyramid and Dingy, it's like that whole survive thing. The survival aspect is down here at the bottom, and Dingy's got that covered. He Dingy started out at the bottom of the ladder. He's not ashamed of it. He's quite understanding of it. But the idea is that we need to work him up the ladder, right? The idea of working him up that ladder. So, yeah. Huh. And so we go up there, and Himeno, I like that we get focused. We get a lot of focus on Himeno in this episode. And she's like, the hunters that devils fear are the ones with the screw loose. Are the ones with a couple of screws loose. You know who the guy that Suda plays? We don't have his name yet. I don't want to know his name. We don't know his name yet. But, I'm going to put him in O. I'm going to put him in O right here. We'll put her there. All right, because we're going to talk about him and O in this. The guy that Suda's voice actor plays, the blonde, he reminds me of like a mixture between, he's a mix between Nanami Kinto from Jujutsu Kaisen, and he's a mixture of that and Pixis from Attack on Titan, and mainly Pixis with the drinking habit, right? And the kind of like stoic self-assuredness, right? Kind of that. But he says that, yeah, devil hunters that the devil fear are ones that are a little bit crazy, right? Because you don't mess with crazy. If there's anything you can learn from real life, folks, don't mess with crazy because it's not going to end well, right? And Sahara had his head on straight, so he died. It's like, you know, only the good die young. Only the, yeah, it's one of those things. Same goes for Kenochi, Subaru, and Sasaki. I was like, I was going to make a joke in the reaction when I was like, oh, Sasaki, I'll say, and I was like, oh, has Miyano hit her across the face on the streets? I was going to make that joke, but then I was like, oh, one, in poor taste, and two, there was no time in the episode. So, yeah, all of, all of Himeno's partners, her former partners... Former partners were all sane, but they died. So he's like, yeah, we, you see a pattern here, right? That anytime you have a decent, normal person, they're not going to last very long. They were reasonable enough to fear the attacks from a devil. And that fear made the devil stronger. That's the thing, right? So that's the thing, the idea. And that's kind of terrifying right because the fear the fear of the devils made them stronger the devil stronger that is that that's kind of crazy because in a lot of stories you use that fear and people use that fear and channel it to make themselves more aware of situations to like hone in and focus but in this story in this world building being afraid is a bad thing being afraid will get you killed because that fear will just lead to the devils getting stronger and stronger. So it makes sense if somebody's reasonable 
then they're going to suffer and because they're just going to make the devil the devil they're up against stronger and stronger. So that's crazy. Uh, it makes sense why power would be somebody you'd want on your side because power's not scared of anything. She's just like, whatever. She's kind of crazy. So it works. And so it's such an interesting world building little tidbit here. And so they're like, you've been working with Aki for a while. What do you think of him? Is his head on straight? And she says, I wouldn't say anything about anybody trying to kill the gun devil being crazy. And he's like, oh, he's like, didn't you join because you were after the gun devil too? So she's after the gun devil as well. Right. After the gun devil. After the gun devil too, which is a way that she can relate to Aki. Makes sense. Right. I will say this for Aki. Aki's, Aki's revenge kind of quells his fear. To an extent, right? Aki's revenge, his desire for revenge. And you can tell, like, it makes sense why Aki wants revenge so badly. Because that that kind of takes the place of the fear. Instead of him being afraid, he's like, no, I have to get revenge. It's sort of like Dingy in survival mode. I've got to do this. I don't have a choice. So he doesn't really have the option to fear. Because revenge requires him to not. So, interesting. He's like, do you have any screws loose? And this answer, him and says, No. So, in other words, she, she wonders, I imagine she wonders why she is alive and they are not. Because she's like, I'm not crazy. I don't have a few screws loose. So, why is it that they died and I'm still here? And that she's, so she's suffering from survivor's guilt, right? So, she's having some survivor's guilt, which is not good. And she's also concerned for Aki. She's concerned for Aki and she has survivor's guilt, which is, which is really tragic, right? Because yeah, you, she's had five partners so far that seemed like they all were like her. They've all died. She's still around. So she's like, why me? And he's like, exactly. Most hunters, including you, are out to put the gun devil down. So yeah, so I like that this guy, the mentor, he's like, he's like, yeah, wanting revenge against the gun devil isn't enough. It's not enough crazy. He's like, everybody wants revenge on the gun devil. That's not enough, right? He's like, there needs to be something more to it than that. He's like, they're honest, earnest, straightforward. And the me and that means the devils knows the devils know exactly how to screw them over. Yeah, he knows how to mess with them. There's no telling what a crazy person's thinking, though. So and even devils are afraid of what they don't understand. So that's really cool world building. So the devils, devils fear what they don't understand. Okay, so at this point, I want to bring up Makima. I want to bring up Makima, and we're going to put her over here. Oh, Makima. Now, I'm going to posit theories from here on in, and I'm probably going to be 90% wrong, maybe more with all of them. But please, in the comments, do not correct me on my theories. Don't confirm or deconfirm them. Let Just let me wallow in my ignorance. Sit there with your cups and your bags of popcorn. Be like, Romania, you fool. Tis wrong, like power. And then when I figure out that I'm wrong, it'll be fun, right? <laughs> We'll all have a good time, a good laugh, and be like, remember when you thought that crazy theory? Oh my God. <laughs> so we'll just do that. But with Makima, I think that Makima has a devil either inside of her or is a fiend. I don't know. I think that because we've established that you can have high intelligent fiends, like power is a good exception. I feel like she either has a devil contract or is a fiend herself. I feel it's one of the two. The eyes thing is is enough. And if she were a devil or a fiend herself, it would explain why power would be afraid of her. It would give her some oomph, some some bite to her bark, right? But based on that whole idea that he says that devils fear what they don't understand, I feel in large part that one of the reasons she kind of wants to sink her claws into Dingy is because she knows she knows his potential. She knows his potential and wants control of that. Because, yeah, if he gets to be 
outside of the realm of power she thinks he's capable of, she might fear him a little bit. Be like, oh, you're a lot more powerful than I thought you could be. Hmm. So she wants to keep him in check and keep him under control because that means she can understand him. She can, that way it, he won't frighten her anymore and have power over her. So, so that's interesting, right? That's where my mind is with Makima when he said that. I was like, hmm, okay. And we'll talk more about Makima as we go through this. But she says, you're drinking too much again. He's like, no. He's like, that's you being sensible. He's like, we can't be unhinged without loosening the screws a bit every day. So the idea of the cigarettes, that makes more sense now. That the cigarettes, the cigarettes and alcohol and sex, which all can be seen as vices, are ways to quote unquote, keep the screws loose. Mm -hmm. It's like she has her cigarettes, he has his alcohol, and that's the way they kind of unwind and kind of keep, keep from getting too straight laced, right? And so I'm curious about his whole scar where he's like got the thing going across his mouth. Curious. And he says, and if you're still visiting your partner's graves every month, then your screws are still pretty tight and you need to like, he's like, you need to move on. He's like, you need, he's like, it's cool that you're honoring them, but you need to, to get away from that or you're going to be wound too tight and a devil's going to snap you like that and it's going to be over. So I like he tells her he's headed home. He's like, Aki's still a punk, so make sure to work him over. Hmm. And she says she'll take one step at a time. He's like, that's not good enough. No. He's like, this kid's serious about collecting the, ch the meat chunks. I like they call the gun devil parts meat chunks. He's like, no, he's going to actually find the devil if he does that. So this is important to know. He's like, no, he's like one step at a time is not good enough. He's like, Aki, if Aki is serious enough, he's going to eventually find the gun devil at that rate. Okay. And I... Himeno does not want him to find the gun devil because she's like, you're going to die. You're too nice. She's like, it's not because you're not strong enough. It's because you're too nice. And you're going to slip up and you're not crazy. And the gun devil's going to kill you. And so she has this trauma, right? Where she just keeps going back to this, like, or she's lost all her partners. So she has this trauma of not wanting to lose Aki. And she's just like, no, if he fights the gun devil, he's going to die. That is curious, though. I was thinking about that in this episode. That do they want to find the gun devil? That, that's a really good question. Like, do, I'm going to put this, pause it, this up there. Do they want to really locate the gun devil? What do we do with that? Because we've established the gun devil moves like the speed of a bullet and kills like thousands of people in a second. That seems unfathomable. That seems like it's hard to wrap my mind around the concept that in a minute it could kill 100,000 people. That's insanity. So trying to wrap your mind around a concept like that, it's like, what do we do with that? How do you even start stopping that? So I'm so fascinated, right? But I'm like, does the government really want them to find the gun devil? I don't know. I don't know if that's really the case. Or what will they do when they find it? Ah. And so then he leaves her. He leaves her at the graveyard. And then she starts freaking out, thinking that Aki's going to find the gun devil if she doesn't do something. And I love that she's just like, no. And she just repeats it over and over again. Like, she, it's very, again, neon genesis. And like, no, 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 no. And that's when she says, no, I don't want to lose him. And says, don't you want to join the private sector with me? Like, come on. So she tried, let's put this up here. She tried to get him to join the private sector with her. She's like, look, I don't want to lose you, Aki. I, you're my partner. I don't want to lose you to this. Like, can we please just leave? And he's like, no. And he goes, and he, I love that he's like, no, I don't want to. She's like, I received a generous offer to join. Instead of chasing the gun devil... We could go out for lunch and see a movie on the way home, which reminds me of the OP when they go to the movie theater. And he's like, and enjoy ourselves. And he says, if you want to go out for drinks, I'll join you. But I have no intention of going to the private sector. He's like, I'll hang out with you if you want company, but I'm not leaving. 
He's like, and I'm going to take your almond tofu. <laughs> Aki likes almond tofu, clearly. And she's like, well, then fine. Hand me a cigarette if you're going to take my almond tofu. And he has the same kind that she has. And it's just that vice where she's like, I got I to gotta keep. She's like, if Aki fights the gun devil, he's going to die. Not because we're too weak. No. Or because it's the kind of devil that can kill hundreds. It's like, it's not just the fact that we're too weak for it. It's not just that. It's not the fact that it can kill hundreds of people in seconds. That's not it either. It's the fact that he's cool and serious and kind. He's too nice. And normal, like most people. And she's like, but then we cut to Dingy, who's just going crazy and like attacking this freaking thing, going insane. And like uses his head to snap it. And it's like, it's over. And then she takes, I love that she takes the ghost hand. I thought for a second it was the devil and I was like, what's happening? But it was, it was the ghost and like revs it up. Like she keeps Dingy going in that moment. She's like, no, no. Mm -mm. So she realizes, she realizes that Dingy just maybe, just maybe could take on the gun devil and that he's not human or normal. What exactly is Dingy? We don't exactly know. So it's like he's a hybrid, but he's not a fiend. That's the thing. He's not a fiend because Pochita hasn't like taken over his body, possessing him. Pochita's like keeping him alive. So it's this weird hybrid, right? It's not exactly like power. It's something totally new and totally different. And, and him and I was like, well, what is this? And I love that she goes, I love that she has the hand and goes and like revs it up. Right. I love that. And like brings him back to life. And she's like, but him. And he's like, Eureka, dude. Oh my God. I love it. He's like, I'll cut you up and you bleed. And he's like, I drink that blood and I heal. He's like, I figured it out. I've cracked the code. I'm a effing perpetual motion machine. Oh my God. He's like, the Nobel Prize is mine. Which is like, dude, you're taking away Powers Nobel? Come on. Okay, Tesla. All right. What are we doing? All right, Edison. Not Tesla. It'd be Edison in that case. But he's like, I've never seen anyone crazier than him. So maybe he can kill the gun devil. And she gets so feverish with it, right? Because that's like her wish. Her wish is to keep Aki safe. And she's like, if I can keep Aki safe. So here's Himeno's logic. Himeno's logic is, okay, in order to keep Aki safe, the gun devil has to die. Because Aki is not going to stop until the gun devil's gone. And Himeno knows that if Aki keeps going after the gun devil, he's going to die. It's just eventual. He's not, Aki is not the type of character can, that can destroy the gun devil. It's just not possible. She's like, if he keeps pursuing it, he's going to die. And she knows he's not going to stop. So she's like, in order to keep him safe, which is her, which is Himeno's goal, Himeno's goal, her wish is to keep Aki safe. In order for that to happen, the gun devil has to die. In order for the gun devil to die, somebody crazy enough to face the gun devil has to do it and it's not Aki so what about Dingy maybe Dingy can kill the gun devil right maybe that will work okay and I I almost wonder I said this in the reaction I was trying to think of like an analogy to talk about it but it seemed like Pochita at one time the way the eternity devil talks Pochita was once very strong the chainsaw, the chainsaw devil was feared by the eternity devil. So what's the deal with that? I, my theory is that Pochita may at one time have been very, very powerful, kind of like the gun devil, but over time people stopped being afraid of the chainsaw and it just, it's power kind of shrunk and shrunk and shrunk until it was like little Pochita. And then it came across dingy, right? Which the, the only analogy I could think that works, and this is the weirdest one is the brave little toaster. 
<laughs> I thought of the Brave Little Toaster. And you know, in that series, there's like, there's, there's like this, the toaster, there's one appliance that is like the old fashioned appliance. And then you have the new appliance that comes in and the new appliance that comes in seems to have more power than the old one. And it asserts its dominance. So all I could think of would be that like the gun devil coming into existence maybe took all the fear away from the chainsaw devil and applied it to it. And without that fear powering it, it became little puppy Pachita and then stumbled across Dingy. Could be wrong. Could be wrong. Probably wrong. But that's kind of my theory with that. So she thinks that Dingy could possibly kill the gun devil. Now, in order for Dingy to kill the gun devil, he's got to be motivated, right? He's got to be motivated. Motivated and keep his screws loose, right? Now, we could argue that Makima is attempting to do the exact same thing, right? We're gonna bring her up here. Makima is trying to do the exact same thing to Dinji. She is trying to keep him motivated and keep his screws loose. Only Makima is a little bit more controlling and kind of control freak about it than Himeno is. Himeno, as we will establish later on in the in the bar scene, is used to using her feminine wiles and using her sexuality to manipulate people. She's done it before, so she thinks that in order to keep Shin, in order to keep Dingy motivated to kill the Gun Devil, that she may need to offer. We'll go put in quotations favors to keep him uh, moving forward. Because the kiss seemed to motivate him. The kiss motivated him quite a lot. And she is learning that this is a 16 year old kid that has no clue how sex or anything works. So she's like, well, I'll just beat Makima at her own game. I'll just, Makima, she's kind of tight about things. She seems pretty prudish about things. I'll just beat her at her own game and get to Dingy before Makima can. I'll sink my claws into Dingy before Makima can. But the thing about it is, Himeno is not sinking her claws into Dingy for her own sake, she's doing it to save Aki. She thinks that the only way, she just created this like cycle here, the only way to keep Aki safe is to get the gun devil killed by Dingy, and the only way to keep Dingy motivated to do it is by offering him these sexual favors, right? And she suspects that Dingy has a crush on Makima, but she also thinks that Aki does too. She thinks that every boy has a crush on Makima, so she's just trying to like beat Makima to the punch. Now, in the next episode, is Dingy and is Dingy going to have sex with Himeno? I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised if they do. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if they do because she's drunk. Um, will it go well? No. <laughs> the kid so far, so far Dingy's first sexual encounters have not gone well. They've gone poorly, quite poorly, and he's been severely disappointed. So, I think, and I think that is a major commentary about the whole, the whole thing, right? Because Dingy, at first he wanted to grope power and he did, did not go well. He was not satisfied. He's like, that was it. Okay. Well, I thought there'd be more than that. Okay. So then he had, um, the kiss. <laughs> that did not go well at all. That was actually his first kiss was actually awful, right? And so he's like, well, that wasn't good. And so now Himeno is offering, is offering sex to him. If he takes it, I, it's either going to go one of two ways. Either, it's either going to go one, well, it could go one of three ways. It could either, one, he could have sex with her and it goes okay and she has to deal with the aftermath of it. And Dingy's like, okay, well, there was that. Let's do that again. But I don't, I think that's the least likely route. I don't think it's going that route. Two, he does have sex with her. It does not go well at all. And Dingy's like, what is even happening now? Everything that I thought was going to happen with a girl is not what I expected at all. What do I do with that? Or three, she doesn't actually end up having sex with him. Or he tells her, no, he's saving himself from <laughs> you know, he's saving himself from Akima or he tells her no. I think either they're going to have sex and it's going to be really, really bad and awkward and terrible. Or two, he's going to say, no, I don't want to have sex with you. And they end up like snuggling in the bed or something. I don't know. I, at this point, I, I don't know. I do appreciate 
that Fujimoto is not afraid to shy away from sex in anime because it's a thing. And like Neon Genesis did not shy away from it. I'm glad that this series does not either. And I'm glad that our protagonist is actually dealing with these things right now. I'm sad that he's dealing with them amidst a group of people that know they're taking advantage of him. And we'll talk about that in the bar scene. But I, that's what I'm kind of, you know, kind of sad about it is that on the one hand, Denji is actually getting to have sexual encounters at a young impressionable age during puberty when you start to experiment and see these sort of things. Um, most shonen protagonists say completely celibate until they get married and they have some kids. And it's like, how was that? <laughs> so, you know, there's that sort of thing. Whereas with Denji, he's getting all the encounters now. He's getting all the awkwardness out of the way, right? The problem is, is that the people he's having these encounters with are all people that are specifically wanting to take advantage of a minor <laughs> and be for their own ends, right? I mean, Himeno, sure, she's trying to save Aki and that's, that's noble. She's trying to save Aki by doing whatever means necessary, but it's really sad and terrible that she's doing it at the expense of a 16 year old boy that doesn't know any different. Makima, who at this point in my eyes is practically a villainess, she's like taking advantage of hardcore, knows exactly what she's doing and does not seem to find anything remotely wrong with it, but we don't know her motivations or what she's doing it for. We just know it's kind of creepy, right? And the thing about it is, is that Denji, all of these encounters that he's had with Power, with Himeno, with Makima, they are all, they are all physical, physical sexual encounters without affection. And that's what sucks because Dingy this whole time, Dingy wants affection. He wants love. And his whole idea to Pochita is that I want to get with a girl that loves me and that I can show affection to and we'll like just sit on the couch, eat toast and play video games. But we're like, you know, we care about each other and love each other. And that's all Dingy wants. And at that, and with that in mind, you kind of root for him because you want him to have those encounters because he's attaching it to like love and affection. But what he's getting instead is this horrible dose of reality where these three women do not hold affection and love towards Denji. They are either using him or just doing it for some other means, right? So it's very interesting, right? But her getting like feverish saying, oh, he, maybe he can kill the gun devil, right? Maybe he can do this. And then, yeah, we cut to three days later, three days later, and Himeno, uh, the idea, of course, everybody's freaking out because they've not eat or drank in three days. They're all dehydrated, freaking out. Arise back to his security blanket. Kobeni is like panicking still. Aki has like healed himself at this point because they didn't have another choice. And Power, I do like the idea that Power stayed with Aki, like I guess to keep him from bleeding out again. I like the idea that she was with him the whole time. <laughs> she just wore out. And then he's like, how long has it been? And she's like, it's been three days since you got stabbed. I like the power's like, meowie, where is he? And she's like, let's all go out for drinks. And since it's over, I'm going to sleep a bit. And she instantly like cuddles up next to Aki. And he doesn't act like this is anything out of the ordinary. So the minute she did that, I was like, okay. I mean, Himeno likes Aki. I think she actually genuinely likes him. Likes him, likes him. Um, but Himeno... She is not, not afraid to get close. But the thing of it is, with, with Dingy, in order to enact her plan, she had to get drunk. With Dingy, she had to get drunk to make it work. She had to be drunk to lower her, her sensibility. Because as her tutor says, you're too sensible. So she had to get drunk in order, like, just like the mentor did, he drank to get the screws loosened up. She had to get drunk to even remotely consider doing anything with Dingy because she's like, nope, he's a 16 year old kid, can't do it. The moment she found out he was 16, she was like chugging down that drink. Like, this is the only way I can do it is if I'm pissed drunk. Whereas with Aki, she immediately gets close to him sober with nothing in her. So I think that's the big difference. I think Himeno, her love, she has a love for Aki, whereas with Dingy, she's just using him to save the person that she loves. How you do, right? But it's sad because that's not fair to Dingy because Dingy doesn't deserve that, right? 
And so we go down to him and, and it's the attorney devil. Like it's, it's two eyes. It looks like the flat, the homunculus from the flask and full metal alchemist. It just, it almost looks like weirdly enough. And this is kind of bizarre, but it looks like a pair of testicles. It just gets like <laughs> severed in two. And then they all get out of there. I, this, this crew, if you know the movie, The Hangover, <laughs> this crew looks like they all have a massive hangover. Like Dingy's just covered in blood. I like that Power leads Aki out though. Look at her. Look at Power. And they all make it out. And Dingy, Dingy's got the piece of gun. And he's like, I'm feeling good. Like I just took a huge shit. He's like, I just feel great. He's like, we got the piece of the gun metal, gun devil. Everything's fine. And then he promptly passes out. And she's like, considering he was fighting for three whole days while he was without sleep. All right. So they go to take him to the hospital. And I like that he has on his arms, like from the chainsaws, he has like the blood. And then on his shirt, it's the blood from the devil. It's cool. I love that they're like, you two head to the office and check in. Orion Kobini, have fun. And they both just look like, what? Like, like they're never coming back. Okay. So then we cut to a further point in time where Aki, she said they were taken to the hospital, but Aki comes back out of the hospital. So there's been some time pass. We don't know what's happened with uh, Power and Dingy, but some time has passed because Aki's back on the scene with him and O looking through the guts to try to find pieces of the gunmetal. Like that's the thing. She's like, well, the division, we're all assembled. So we need to get together and discuss our issues. Like Kobini and Arai are talking about quitting. Don't blame them. I don't think they're suited for it, right? She says no. She's like, not only are they afraid of the devils, which is a sign that they're going to get killed, but they feel guilty about trying to kill Dingy too. Yeah. I'm like, at this point, Kobini and Arai, they just need to get out of there because they're just, they're walking targets at this point and they'll just endanger everybody else. And Aki's like, well, you tried to kill Dingy too. And she's like, I know, right? Kids these days are so sensitive. Hmm. She's like, would it kill him be a little bit bolder? And she she puts on this front, right? Him and O puts on this big front about being bold. She's like, you have to be bold to survive, which again ties to her asking Dingy for sex. Like just again, part of this master plan up here. Or she's like, would it kill him to be bolder? And she's like, over drinks, they'll be able to apologize to Dingy and we'll convince him not to quit. Which I don't know. I, I would let him quit. I would not want Arai and Hobini to stick around, Hobini to stick around. But I feel like based on what that mentors told her, they're going to die. So why would you even, why would you keep them around? But maybe they don't, maybe they don't have a choice. Maybe since they're in the public safety commission, they've got to do their job or they do die anyway. So might as well die doing your job. Right. But here's the thing again, going with the, the idea of having a few screws loose, Aki searching through the devil guts for a sliver of a bullet. Just enough because he can't let it go without finding every last piece. There is a screw loose there with Aki. A wee bit. A wee bit. He reminds me a little bit of um, Fushigoro from um, Jujutsu Kaisen. We're a little unhinged, just not on the surface, right? And I like, I do like that shot of, of Himeno when Aki's like, you're just in it for the drinks. And she's like, <laughs> yeah, you keep telling yourself that. Sure. It, I found a chunk of its flesh. If we're doing it, it needs to be this week. And she's like, why? And he's like, if we're having a drinking party, I want to invite Miss Makima. And it's like, why would you want to buy? Oh, okay. You can see like the, the parts and pieces of the attorney devil, like just in there in the hotel thing. Gross. So the thing is, Aki wants to invite Makima. And clearly because she's going on a business trip to Kyoto next week with so many devils targeting Dingy, she's looking for reinforcements. Okay. So she is going to Kyoto for reinforcements to protect Dingy. Okay. And then she's going to get reinforcements because there's devils targeting Dingy. Okay. And so she needs, the party needs to be this week. But that doesn't explain why Aki wants her to go to the party. So the question is, does Aki, I mean, we've, we've all kind of guessed this at this point, that Aki has a crush on, a crush on Makima. So there is an, an aspect of Himeno that is jealous. Jealous of Makima and her hold 
on Aki. Hmm. Yeah, I get the distinct impression that Himeno is jealous of her. And she's just in there smoking like, well, be honest with me. What do you think Dinji is? And Aki's like, the devil seemed to know about him. And I've never seen anything like what he turned into. But the biggest mystery is how Miss, how much Miss Makima seems interested in him. Yeah, like, what's the deal with that? And Aki's like, well... She used to travel all the time, but she stuck to Tokyo lately. And that's probably because of Dingy. So she's got multiple, she's like, does she know his secret? So there's multiple reasons behind this. Himeno is trying to like plant a bug in Aki's ear that maybe Makima, I feel like Himeno is trying to point out to Aki that I know you got a crush on this girl, but she's sketch AF. So you need to be careful because she's, attaching herself to Dingy, so she may praise you and tell you sweet nothings, but she's also telling sweet nothings to Dingy. So she's like, you need to be careful, Aki. It's almost like Himeno is trying, and it's kind of catty the way that she does it, but she's trying to tell Aki, like, do not think that you are somebody that, that Makima is interested in, because you're not. That's what she's kindly trying to tell him. And Aki doesn't answer the question. They just exhale at the same time. And she's like, want to get her hammered and ask about it? <laughs> I like that in the end, though, Himeno cannot, she can't refute Aki, even though she doesn't like the idea of Makima being there. She doesn't like the idea of Aki liking Makima. In the end, she doesn't want to make him feel bad, so she agrees, let's have her go there. Why not? And so then we have the dinner scene. I like the transition. I love the transition of the ashtray in her palm to the ashtray on the dinner table. So cinematic. I love it. And the beer and the tea. The beer and the tea. I love it. And so let's establish that uh, Power and Dingy are not drinking. Power is having tea as well, which is fun. And so they're all eating at this restaurant together. Them and these other people, right? And poor Kobini, she's late with her little sailor outfit. So where do I even start? So we have, there's three others that are there as well. Three other devil hunters that we don't really know. And so Aki says it's been six months since he's drank. And I love that, I love that Power's like, away with you! The sashimi shall all be mine! I, I love Power more and more each episode. She's so fun. And I just love how just abrasive she is. But it's not anything, like, it's just, she's a devil. So it, it kind of comes with the territory. And once you accept it, it's like, yep, that's just how she is. What else do we do? Okay, cool. And what I like about Power's character is that she she doesn't flaunt around her sexuality like from the... I, what I was afraid of is way back in episode four, four and five, what I was afraid of was that Power was going to be this character that was like flaunting her boobs around asking Dingy to grab them every five minutes. And I was like, I don't want that. But that's not her character at all. And I love it for it. She just did it that one time because she made a contract with Dingy. She had to do it. Had to fulfill it. Had to be done. But that's not who her character is. And I love her character for it. And he's like, what even is this? It looks tasty. And then, of course, Kobini shows up with her little hat and everything. Really cute. And then this lady over here. This lady. This one lady in the corner. She's like flirting with every girl at the table. With Himeno, with Kobini, with Power. This lady's like all about it. She's like, any lady at the table. Hello. It's fun. And so then Arai... We see the one guy here who has the, the scar where his glasses are. We see him. And then I love that Power just is eating. She's just stabbing the sushi and stuff and eating it like just with her hands list. Like very caveman. I love it. It's great. And she's like, I've never had anything this good before. Kobeni. She's like, you send most of your pay home, don't you? It's, it's cute because Kobeni, we established a little character building. Kobeni rarely eats out for herself. She gives all the money to her family. Hmm. And then I love that Power is like, I don't care about your tragic life story. I'm going to eat this chicken, damn it. This fried chicken is all mine. Oh, my God. And I love that Arai's like, oh, so Fushi, did you? Okay, you didn't bring your fiend, Fushi. Okay, all right. And he says, no, they're a little too scary for a place like this. Okay, so we established this character. I'm going to put him up here. That Fushi, Fushi had a partner die, had a partner die, 
but also has a fiend with him, like power. Okay, so we established that there are fiends roaming around assisting the devil hunters. It's not just power. Power is not an anomaly. She's just one of many possible fiends. Okay, I like Fushi's character. He's interesting. He's very cut and dry, and they established he has like 134 IQ, so he's super smart. I like Fushi so far. We don't know much about him, but I'm curious about what his fiend is and his too scary fiend for a place like this. It'd be funny if, I wonder if the angel is his fiend. I wonder if the angel, the, the character with the angel wings and the halo, I wonder if that's a fiend and that's the one that's with Fushi. It'd be kind of funny because we said they're a little too scary for a place like this. I was like, you would, that'd make you think they're a big giant scary monster. But what if it was the angel? What if Fushi's uh, fiend was the angel character and they're just too scary because of the wings and the halo? It'll freak people out. Maybe, maybe it's the death devil and <laughs> it's in the form of an angel. I don't know. He's like, I envy how reasonable yours is. Although that suggests that if it was the angel that they're, that it's crazy and off kilter, again, could be the case. I, I like that power is considered reasonable. Very fun. And then this guy, this older guy, is like, you're young, so order whatever you want and eat up. Like this big, rough-looking guy. And then Denji can't read most of the kanji. And then he sees Kisu Tempura, tempura and he remembers the kiss. So again, our 16-year-old Denji, he never went to school. He cannot read. Read well. He can read a little bit, but he can't read well. And I'm like... So sad, right? So him and always drinking before Dingy asks this, but he goes, he goes, he's like, about that kiss. And she says, oh, well, she's like, I'm too bashful to do it right now. Let me drink a bit more first. And he's like, oh, okay. Then she's like, okay, sure. I, I don't know why you have to drink to kiss people, but okay. Like, yeah, him and oh, she's like, no, I'm too sensible I gotta get drunk before I kiss this kid. Like, she doesn't want to kiss him. She doesn't want to use him. But in order to do it, she's like, I need to get a little drunk first. And then she's like, I'll make it a juicy one too. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh. So she's like, will you forgive us for trying to kill you? And then she's just like, oh yeah, dude, all's forgiven. Super forgiven. Like, not even thinking about it. And this guy, this, this guy looks like Rock Lee over here. He's like, this is a welcoming party for the rookies. Shut up and introduce yourself. Or stand up and introduce yourselves. And then he's like, your name, age, and the devil you're contracted with. And Aki says, don't reveal your devil contract in public. So that's another bit of lore too, right? We get this idea that the devil hunters can all know about it. But you don't, don't reveal the contract in public. Not supposed to do that. Apparently, what does he say about it? He says, you shouldn't reveal that contract. You shouldn't share it with anyone you don't trust. Hmm. And he's like, oh, don't you ever loosen up? And that's, and the moment, the moment that the one guy says, don't you ever loosen up, Aki, that's when Himeno is like, oh, it's fine. So Himeno's trying to distract herself from the fact that, yeah, Aki is a straight-laced character, he's probably going to die. So she's constantly, this whole episode, trying to, like, avoid the reality that Aki's in danger, right? And she's had her whole world shaken from nearly losing Aki. So it's fueling a lot of her actions in this. And she's like, and I love this one girl's like, I want to know about your hobbies, too. They can tell a lot about a person. And he's like, oh, hi, I'm Dingy. I'm 16, if I remember right. Maybe. We don't even know if he's 16. He might be 14 or 15 for all we know. He might be 17 or 18 for all we know. But he barely remembers how old he is. That's so freaking sad. And he's like, if I remember right. And the moment he says, I'm 16, him and O's like, you're only 16. You're a baby. No, no, no. And he says, my hobbies are eating and sleeping. And he's so happy saying that. He's just like, hmm. but yeah, so his hobbies are eating and sleeping. That's it. That is the bottom of the pyramid. 
like just eating and sleeping. Eating and sleeping is not a hobby. That's what you have to do to live. That is a basic requirement of life. And that's his hobby. That just shows you like the state that Dingy's in like mentally and emotionally and mature wise. And the one older guy is like, oh my God. And Kobini's like, she's like, yikes, that is young. And she's like, oh, you didn't drink, did you? And he's like, oh, just tea. So yeah, so I, interestingly enough, okay, we're going to talk about this later, but Denji has not drank. He's only had tea. Okay. And then Arai is 22 and he's like, I've got a contract with the fox devil and my hobby is writing haiku. He's a poet! Harai is a damn poet! But this is interesting too. He's got a contract with the same fox devil. And Denji's like, it's the same devil as Hiya, hiya, Captain! He says, Hiya, Captain! I love that he calls Aki Hiya, Captain! That's so freaking cute! And he's like, Yes, the fox devil is friendly towards humans. She's got contracts with lots of hunters. Okay, so we find out that the fox devil is kind of like Pochita, where it's friendly, friendly with humans, and has lots of of contracts. Okay, I feel a little bit better about that, oddly enough, because one, it establishes that there are there are devils that are willing to work with humans, like Pochita and this fox devil. Again, fox and the hound, besties for life. But I like the idea that the fox devil being friendly with humans means it's like, oh yeah, I'll make lots of contracts with all of you humans and I'll slowly devour you. Like, I'll just take a little nibble here, little nibble there, little nibble there, keep myself satisfied. So that's actually not, a, that's pretty smart for a devil to be like, yeah, I'll get lots of contracts with different humans and I'll constantly have a food source all the time. I don't have to want for anything. So yeah, that whole friendly business is rather interesting. Hmm. And it's a female devil but she only lets hot ones call on her head. And then, yeah, and at that moment, Himeno saying only letting the hot ones, She's she's been drinking and she likes Aki. Yep, that's the other red flag. As Devils goes, she's down bad. Uh-huh. And I like that, then she's like, I don't understand what that means. And then Kobini stands up before we can get any further. But yeah, so uh, yeah, Himeno, she's got it bad for Aki, right? And so Kobini says that she's Kobini Higashima. She's 20 and she's got a devil contract, but it's a secret. And my hobby is eating tasty things. So she's kind of like in the same boat as Dingy, bottom of the pyramid. We talked about this with earlier before the reaction that her and Dingy have been in similar life situations. She's like, she's in the same boat as Dingy has been, kind of, um, only she can't talk about her devil contract and she freaks out constantly, whereas Dingy's kind of accepted everything. So it's curious that Kobini and Dingy are kind of, they're similar characters, but on the opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of how they mentally deal with everything. So that's kind of cool. All right. And then isn't her outfit cute? Like this lady's flirting with everybody. And she's like, it's a hand-me-down for my sister. Makes me feel bad. And Kobini has eight sisters. Oh my God. So it's, she is the opposite of Dingy, polar opposite. She not only, she's in the same situation as Dingy money-wise, but she has eight sisters and one brother, I bet. And one brother. I bet that's why they let him go to college because he's the brother. He's the only male in the family. A, so there's like at least nine of them. There's at least, no, 10 of them. That'd be 10. She has eight sisters, her and her brother. That'd be 10 of them. Oh my God. Okay. Okay. Isn't that crazy? And then Himeno says, where's your rookie, Fushi? And that's when he says, I'm sad to report that they were killed yesterday. And the way that Fushi says it, Fushi kind of looks like Jean from Attack on Titan, by the way. But the way that Fushi says it, it's just emotionless. Like, he's like, oh, I'm sad to report that they died yesterday. Just like, like it was nothing. Just like, like, oh, by the way, I missed the work yesterday because I was sick. That's how he said it, basically. And Himeno who we know for a fact has been traumatized by the loss of her own partners, she tries to cope through it and is like, oh, rest in peace, and uses her being drunk to, to kind of like get over the fact of not being sad, to not draw attention to it. So she she puts on, puts on a front to hide her real emotions. 
she is putting on a facade to hide how she really feels, right? Because she doesn't want to feel pain about it, right? And she's like, oh, they'll be missed, pissed, missed, right? And they're like, oh, already wasted, huh? And then Kobini and Arai, I, like, power cares not, power, power cares not. She's just eating the fried chicken, doesn't care about this whole discussion. But Arai and Kobini are like, do people really die that often? And they're like, yeah, the public safety handles the devils that are too tough for the private sector. Like, we're handling the worst of the worst. That's why that's why him and I wanted to go private, so they wouldn't be dealing with the, the messed up stuff. And she's like, yeah, we're always dropping like flies. No one who joined up at the same time as me is still alive. So that one lady's like, everyone else that, that signed up the same time I am, they're dead. You guys are all fresh faces. It's like, mm. And Dingy kind of looks at her like, huh. But Himeno says Dingy's not going to die because he wants a smooch. And then she's like, I do want a smooch. Yeah. He's like, oh, he's like a damn puppy. Dingy's like, yes, I do want that smooch. Yes. He's like, yeah. And I love that he's like, wow, Himeno gets really friendly. Friendly when she's drunk. Uh, and then she's like, what? Friendly? He's like, I'm pretty sure she's kissed everyone here apart from the rookies. So all of them have been kissed. Like Aki's been kissed. He's been kissed. Fushi's been kissed. The woman's been kissed. The guy with glasses has been kissed. Himeno gets a bit flirty and uh, a little promiscuous when she's drunk. Okay? And she keeps drinking because she knows she's going to try to seduce Dingy. Okay. Okay. And Dingy's like, oh, there's no escaping her. And she's just like, yep. And he's like, that's a guaranteed kiss. I'm like, Dingy, you fool. You fool. It, nobody's told Dingy that's not a good thing. It's like, no, her her guaranteed kiss is not a good thing. But Dingy's maybe 16 and doesn't know any better. He's just like, I want my first kiss. And all he can see is her lips. Mm-hmm. Today's the day of my first kiss. Oh, is it? And then, of course, like, out of the freaking nowhere, out of nowhere, Makima's like, what kiss? Like, it just shows up like a damn poltergeist, right? Just shows up like a poltergeist. And he's like, oh, you're here, you. I want to get her, like, the image of her, yeah, just showing up. Like, what are you talking about, Denji? What's happening? Like, Makima is crazy. I'm fully convinced Makima, Makima is secret crazy. There's, like, there's crazy, and then there's, like, secret crazy. Makima's secret crazy. I'm pretty sure. She shows up fashionably late. You know, okay. Fashionably late. You know who she reminds me of? I, there was a girl I knew in college and she was the type of person, she was super popular and she was super popular, really mysterious and everything. But she was always a pain to talk to because she was the kind of person that you couldn't talk to unless everything revolved around her. If the story or the situation wasn't revolving around her answering a question or her telling a story, she would just zone out and not have any part in it. And if you were trying to tell a story, she'd just be like off in space. But the moment the attention came back around to her, she was all about it. And I'm not a big fan of those type of people. I'm like, mm. she's not down to earth at all. She's very, very concerned seated and I don't know there's just a vibe of Makima that reminds me of that girl and every time I saw her in this episode I was like that's her that's her and I was just like mm. it's just crazy right but yeah she's just like what kiss and then she shows up and she's I what I love is she's like I'll take a draft beer domestics <laughs> you plebeians she's like no thank you and she takes off her black coat and of course Aki says have a seat Miss Makima, as he gestures to her to sit next to him. Yeah, yeah. And Himeno, of course, notices that Aki gives up his seat, the seat next to him, right for Makima. He's got it bad, too. And I like the one lady says, I've never seen her in person before. So Makima does not just strut around the Public Safety Commission. She's rather mysterious. And I feel like she's only there because Aki... Well, Aki thinks that she's there because he invited her. We all know she's there because Dingy's there. So there's that. But yeah, and she sits there, of course. And is like, so are you kissing somebody, Dingy? And he's like, no, ma'am. And he's like, oh, are we not going to kiss Dingy? And he's like, we are. And so poor Dingy. Dingy's like, Dingy is stuck between wanting to save his kiss for this girl that he likes, Makima, 
and his desire, his physical desire to kiss someone and it being offered right in front of him. So Denji is experiencing for the first time the idea of choice and that you, because Denji's always had in front of him that he needs these things to survive. And so he didn't, choice was not an option. If you get trash in front of you, you eat the trash because you need it to live. If you see something in front of you that you need to survive, you take it and you use it. And so the idea that, that Himeno is putting out there for him, like, here, you want a kiss? I'll give you a kiss. And he's like, oh, yeah, cool. I want that. I need that. But now he's in a situation where he actually has a choice. He could kiss Himeno because it's right there in front of him. Or he could wait and try to earn it from Makama. So it's like, what do we do? Do we go with this hierarchy of need or now do we have the option of want and choice? And so it's like dingy. And we see right after he says that, the two empty plates in front of him. And it's almost symbolic, like whatever option he picks, either to wait for Makima or to get the kiss from Himeno, both options will leave him empty, like those plates that are in front of him. Because neither of them are offering him true affection. What he actually needs, neither of those options are going to give him. And so, ah, oh, I love it. I love like Fujimoto, genius that symbolism. She's not even through with the first beard. She's like, another one. And then she's like, what do I do? She's like, what about these kisses? He's like, I don't want Miss Makima to see me kiss Himeno. And Makima's like, what's up? And Himeno's like, oh, come on. Like she can, they're both reading him, but I want to kiss with tongue just as bad. So it's like that trying to measure out which one do we do? So he's like, maybe I'll just change the subject. And he's like, Makima, I got one of them gun devil thingies. Like, he's just like a little kid, right? And she's like, that's very impressive, Denji. She just sounds like, you know, Denji sounds like a school kid. Like, oh, Miss Makima, I found the gun devil thing. And she's like, that's very good, Denji. Keep on finding more of them and maybe I'll give you a sticker. Like, that's what she sounds like, right? And so he's like, we've never seen devils appearing with the gun devil flesh this frequently before. I like that Aki just comes out and asks. Like, him and Himeno were, like, talking about Dinji being different. And you think it's going to be this covert thing that they don't just come out and ask Makima about it. But he's like, no. He's like, what's the deal? He's like, something must be going on. What is the deal with Dinji, ma'am? I like, he's like, ma'am? And she just... And she just stares at him for an unreasonably, an unreasonably long amount of time. She just stares like, that was bold of you to ask. Just ask me outright. And then she just, she just takes a drink and doesn't answer him. And it's like, what the hell? And she says, oh, I'll tell you if you can out drink me. I, mm, mm. Okay, so Makima. Makima. The idea of control and the level of control that she has. She is willing, willing to answer and provide knowledge. But the kicker is under unreasonable circumstances. Here's the thing. Makima seems like the type of character she does not engage in a battle that she knows she's going to lose. So in the last several episodes, when Dingy comes up to her and he's like, I don't know. He's like my first time, like grabbing a girl's boobs. It didn't turn out how I wanted to. I don't know if this is all worth it and blah, blah, blah. Makima's like, Hmm, I've got to keep him under my thumb, but I don't want to promise him something that I would just freely give without anything in return. So what I'll do is say, yes, Dingy, I will gladly do anything you ask if you can do this impossible task. Because she knew that he wasn't going to be able to do it. She may hope that he gets as strong as the gun devil and hopes it becomes he becomes a devil that's, fear, that's fearsome. She may be hoping for that, but she knows that he has got a long, long, long way to go before he's going to fight that gun devil and beat him. And so that's why she made the deal because she's like, yeah, it's impossible. You're not going to do that. And so here with Aki, she's like, oh, you want me to reveal all the secrets that I know about Dingy and everything I know? <laughs> That's so ballsy of you to ask me in front of all these people where I can't possibly refuse. I'll give you your answers if you can do this task that's impossible. So she's like, yeah, if you can outdrink me, go right ahead. And she knows that they're not, that's not going to be able to happen. And Aki hasn't had a drink in six months. So no, it's not going to happen. And he's like, oh, and he's like, two more beers, please. But he just like, you see him shrink. You see him visibly shrink on screen. Like, 
okay, two more beers. And then we cut to all these drinks. And him and I was like, sure, I, I went in on that. Make it three. And then I love that. I, I love that Power cares not about this contest. But she's like, horse sashimi, fried chicken, and more horse sashimi. Like, Power is going to eat the four horsemen of the apocalypse by the end of this so she can get her Nobel Prize. And he's like, I want fried chicken too. I like that the two devils in the room are ordering fried chicken and everybody else is like drinking. And there's like, you know, a dozen drinks on that table at least. Himeno is like, out. Aki's done. And Makima's like, oh, another beer if you would please, before she's even finished with the other one. Oh my God. But Power, and it looks like Arai has the tea too now. And he's like, you're impressive, Power. There aren't a lot of fiends who can control their urge to kill. And she's like, I, a feat of my advanced IQ. I feel like Power, you know, in being, Power is very proud of herself. And so the fact that she's not killing people, she's like, oh, it's, it's to, you know, put myself out there as a superior being, you know, I love that. And she's like, how high is yours then? And I like that, that Power doesn't really know. And she's like, um, a hundred? Is that high? And she's like, well, I was around 100. She's like, oh, well, then it was 120. She instantly wants to be better than the humans. She's like, no, oh, then it was instantly higher. And Fushi's is 134. Very high. Mm -hmm. He's proud enough to actually remember it. And she's like, if I recall, mine was 500. <laughs> Perhaps 1,000. And then poor Himeno, girl. And she like instantly starts kissing him. And then I like that Makima goes, oh my. Makima's like, I don't know what spurred this on. So Makima's like, hmm. But, oh my God. Uh, just, and Makima watching him. Watching him kiss her as she drinks the beer. Absolutely terrifying. No, no. There, there's a little bit, there's like a little part of it that's like, that makes you wonder if Makima kind of like gets off on that sort of thing. But then you're like, no, no, it doesn't. And I'm sorry, I've got to, I've got to get past the barf thing. I can't, I can't, I can't do the barf thing. Instantly we go to him and Pochita, which them eating the trash and him holding Pochita. And I like that he offers, he's like, he's like little Aladdin digging through the dumpster and offering a boo offering a boo some trash it's like oh my god these these two little beans but he looks over right they're eating the trash and he looks over and sees the rats eating the puke and he's like check it out pachita those rats are chowing down on some drunk guy's puke Ugh. he says eating puke what a joke and so it's like, at that moment, Dingy's like, he's like, look at them. He's like, we may be at the bottom of the ladder, but we're not that low. We may be eating out the garbage, but we're not eating what the rats eat. We're above them, Pachita. Check us out. Mm. What kind of mammals are they? And then we cut to Dingy, like, throwing up with Arai. I love that Arai stuck with him. Good on Arai. Look at him. He's like, Himino has no restraint. Ugh, that just makes me sick to my stomach. And I love that Arai's like, like, Dingy's just crying because it's like throwing it up. It's like, oh, dude, been there. I, nobody's thrown up my mouth ever, but been there being sick. And he's like, he's like, my method works pretty well, right? Ugh. I used to look after my mom when she came home drunk from work. So yeah, all these people have got issues. Like Arai, Arai's got some issues. So that he's been dealing with. So it's like, holy shit. But he's like, not that it makes me as good of a devil hunter as you. Mm. He's like, I'm jealous. And I like that Dinji's like, you're jealous of me? He's like, my first kiss tasted like barf. He's like, and you're jealous? And her eyes like, oh. He's like, yeah. So I like that Dinji's like, seriously, dude? Like, you think that you got it worse than me right now? And her eyes like, yeah, we all got it pretty bad, right? So they go out onto the street and so we see that we see that power I like that power power has stepped up her game power is like carrying Aki around all over the place I love that at the start of this series power was like I don't like you top not me and now she's like carrying him out of the bar and like saving him and stuff I'm like I love that developed relationship this lady here is also getting on Kobini Kobini girl you, you got somebody interested in you 
And then I like that Makima has her coat on and everything. And it powers like, I will, she's like, oh, I'll, what did she say here? What did Maki say? Maki said this. She's like, I drink a lot. I'll see Aki to his household. I'll see Aki and his household home. Oh, she's going to follow Aki and power back to their house. Interesting. And she's like, Arai, look after Himeno. And so Makima paid the tab. Okay. So Makima, she paid the tab and is going to take Aki home. Okay. Okie dokie. I feel like she was wanting to take Aki home to go with Denji as well, right? And she told Arai to watch him and O. Okay. And then at that point, Kobini's like, nothing tastes better than drinks someone else paid for. Very true. Very true. And then Makima's like, wait a minute. Where's Denji Kun? And that's when they say, I saw him and O pick him up and walk off somewhere. Him and I was like, you're not sinking your claws into him. I am. So here's the thing. He's like, it's so dark. So yeah. So here's the thing. Dingy is wanting water. So so Dingy, Dingy didn't drink, right? Dingy didn't drink. He had tea the whole time, but he had a harrowing experience getting barfed down his throat and like throwing up and being sick. So it just completely knocked him out makes sense and so he was like begging for water right he's like the puke the girl the puke girl gave me a barf kiss Ugh. he's like damn it water and that's what he's again asking for that basic necessity right and that's when he sees him and oh and she is drunk drinks more beer Enough to like, like, girl, like these guys went to the Masato, the Masato Katsuragi school <laughs> of how to handle minors. I'm joking, but I'm joking. But yeah, she like drinks the beer and gives it to him. And we go to her house where she has this pretty sweet ass window that's got like the flat fractured glass. But again, her house is pretty spare. There's not a lot there. There's like makeup brushes, and, like a table. There's not a lot there at all. Oh my God. And his, she's like, oh, it's dingy. What are you doing in my place? I thought for a second she was going to take the eye patch off. She's like, did I bring you here? Like, girl's got some shredded arms. Girl didn't skip arm day. I wonder if, so the question is, did she intend to bring dingy back? I think she did. Or was there part of her that wishes it was Aki that she brought back? Mm. I think she intentionally brought dingy there. But also she, she's drunk. And so he's like, I'm so dizzy. What the hell? Like, did did he drug? Did she drug him? I don't know. What's going on? So I'm like, and she says, I've noticed your head over heels from Makima. And he's like, and he says, my head's spinning. I'm like, did she drug him? Did she give him like, did she give him like a roofie or something? What'd she do to him? Why is he, he didn't drink at the restaurant. So why is his head spinning? What, did she drug him? Are we going to get a flashback before when they were leaving the bar and she drugged him? What do we do? You could do better than that, bitch. Yeah, uh-huh. So Himeno does not like Makima. She's like, you and Aki fawning all over her. So really, it's not that she cares about Dingy fawning over her. It's the fact that Aki fawns over Makima and she doesn't like her. She thinks that Aki should like her instead. Mm. She's like, seriously, move on. Oh my God, with the bull and the horns. Oh my God. And then, yeah, she just, and of course, she her like pressing against Dingy's mouth and everything. Like there, it's a very, very intimate scene drawn. And of course she's like pressing herself up against him. Oh my God. Like, okay. And poor Dingy. Dingy has no clue what to do because he's 16. He just had his first kiss. He doesn't know how sexual encounters work. He just doesn't know. So I'm like, you're, this is like the worst possible person you could be taking advantage of. And that's when she says, do you want to do it? Oh my God. So yeah, oh, I've talked for an hour and a half. <laughs>
Shit. Ah, but yeah, so yeah. It it is it is at this point, at this point, Power's the best female character in the show in terms of being um well-rounded and not taking advantage of a 16-year-old boy. I Power against all odds is the female character of the hour, right? Cuz Power doesn't care about that sort of thing. She's a fiend. She don't care about that. She's not in it for it. She just wants she just wants her Nobel Prize and to eat all the meat. She doesn't care about anything like that. Or taking and, and Power has actually shown herself to be taking care of Aki, to like be out there for Dingy. Like I Power's grown on me a lot. I to be honest, I didn't think I would like Power's character in this series, and she's probably my favorite female character right now. Um Makima is fascinating because she, I think she's evil. <laughs> I think she's evil. <laughs> And she's just very good at hiding it. I think she's secret crazy. And Himeno, I here's the thing about Himeno's character. Himeno's character is incredibly flawed. Very flawed. And I could instantly see why a lot of people would not like Himeno's character. Because she's taking advantage of Dingy. And she gets drunk and tries to have her way with him. And Dingy has no clue what's going on. He's a BB. Um... And so I totally get that. I, I definitely understand why people would not like him and his character. I honestly, I find her very fascinating and she's flawed, but I get what she's, I get where she's coming from. I don't like the actions that she takes with trying to seduce Dingy and taking advantage of him, especially when she knows what she knows about him. But I do get what her goals are and I feel bad for her. I feel bad for her because I get, I get why she likes Aki and I guess she wants to keep him safe, and she's using Dingy to try to do it, and it sucks for Dingy. And I hate that because I love Dingy's character. Like, bless his bones, he's just trying to live a life and learn things. And what a coming of age story, right? It feels very there's very fully cooly vibe in this too. We talk about fully cooly at the start of this. Um, I what I, from what I remember of fully cooly, I always associated it with puberty and sexual awakening. There's a lot of metaphors in that series that are pretty on the nose. Um, that I remember. And so I feel like this is the, the Fujimoto's most messed up coming of age story. <laughs> it's with Dingy. Ah! First kiss, first kiss, and then possibly the first time having sex in a day. I don't know. I, if you told me that he was gonna have sex with her in the next episode and that it was just like the most batshit thing ever, wouldn't be surprised. But I don't know. I feel like it's either going to happen and it's going to be bonkers and bad or it's not going to happen. So either way, I'm sure there'll be I'm sure there'll be some fun thematic stuff come out of it, right? <laughs> but man, this episode, this, it, I, I don't know if this is my favorite episode yet or not. It's hard. I really like this episode a lot. It's, it's up there. This episode's up there as one of my favorites so far. It's my jam. This kind of stuff's my jam. So this intense character development and examining the flaws of a character and their whole psyche and, and comparing them to other characters and all that's going on with them. There's a lot going on in this episode and I really like it. And now we'll see if Dingy's going to do the damn thing. So ah! I hope not. I really, I hope Dingy doesn't have sex because he's not ready. I don't want him to, like, get compromised, especially by a drunk Himeno, but I don't know what'll happen. Maybe Makimo will, like, burst through the window and be like, no! I doubt that, but we'll see. So, in any case, I, I'm i curious to know your thoughts down below. Please, no spoilers, but if you feel bad for Dingy like I do, leave a little comment in the chat for our boy down below, because he's had a rough, rough, he's had a rough week. So in any case, I hope you all have a wonderful week in contrast. <laughs> Stay safe, take care, and yeah, I'll be back next week with more Chainsaw Man. Rule of eight! See you then.